BioBalance HealthCast, episode 243, How to Prepare for a Doctor Visit. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. When you know that you have a doctor's visit coming up, whether that's physically going to the doctor's office and talking to them or, or using some sort of mediated technology to talk to them, uh, you have a short window of time to have their attention. And a lot of times the doctor's office visits now are averaging about one patient every five to seven minutes. Which is and they crazy, rotate but... through. <laughs> uh, so you, you have a little bit of snapshot to get their attention and say, uh, help me. And they don't know how to help you unless you know how to tell them what's going on with you. So this week what we're going to talk about is are, are a group of suggestions that we want to make to you in preparation of a doctor's vision. This is for non-emergent care. You show up in the emergency room, there's obviously a visible thing, broken Usually there's leg, blood heart attack, somewhere, blood, or yeah, pain that, somewhere. That they'll focus on and then they'll they'll do triage and they'll focus on your broken toe later. Uh, <laughs> but when you know you're going to the doctor's visit, whether it's a yearly checkup or you've been sick for a week and you need to get in and you go in, there are some things that you ought to do in advance uh, that will facilitate maximizing your interaction with the doctor so that you can get the most out of the visit mm -hmm. for your own health. So Now, now when I, when I, now I have doctor, now I have visits that are 45 minutes and an hour long, which is, awesome for me because then I get to learn who the patient is and find out their problems and ask directed questions and I already have a questionnaire mm -hmm. that they filled out so I kind of have an idea of what's going on with them before they walk in the door but that's not the typical doctor's visit the typical doctor's visit is your doctor picks up you have to know what's going on behind the scenes they pick up your chart or they look on your on your um I, their iPad and they say you know your picture your name what you were in for last why you're there today, maybe, mm -hmm. and then they walk in the door. Well, it'll say your blood pressure. Yeah, that's true. Because the nurse always takes your blood pieces, pressure yeah, when you go blood in. Blood pressure and pulse. And pulse. And but that doesn't tell us a lot. It tells us legs. if you're alive or if you need <laughs> yeah, your hypertension exactly. treated. So, like, for gynecology, I'd, I'd walk in and, and my visits would always run over <laughs> a lot because I'd say, how are you and what are, what are you here for and what's your problem? Then patients would tell me everything they ate for a month and then the, or they'd tell me their aunt so-and-so had this and they wouldn't get to the point, which wasted our time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that I would, I, it's a little frustrating. You're supposed to direct the conversation, but sometimes you just can't. But part of it was because they didn't think about their visit before the minute they walked in my door. Right. And even if you're, you usually have a little time to wait, you could even just do this plan mm -hmm. while you're in the waiting room. But you should think about why you're there, what's bothering you the most, your priorities of problems, and tell, tell your doctor, here's why I'm here, and hand them a piece of paper with everything you think is important. Not everything you ate, unless you're doing a weight loss clinic or a weight loss diary. But, but basically, think about the things that are important. That will help your doctor get to a point where he or she can figure out what's wrong with you mm -hmm. and treat you at the same visit, not make you keep coming back. Right. Wait, you know, and that wastes your time and theirs. Right. So and efficiency is everything. And then when we get to virtual visits, what mm -hmm. we were talking about earlier, was you're going to be on on a computer looking at your doctor that's th who's thousands of miles away having a conversation with her and mm -hmm. and that's caught that usually is charged by the minute or by the half hour or whatever so it's your money too right, right. so basically that's something that you have to be very efficient about well and there are some things and men and women tend to be different about a lot of this stuff as i'm sure <laughs> all of you know uh, a lot of men in my acquaintance don't track their own medical history. They don't know what they're allergic to. They don't know what medicines they've taken. They don't want know what illnesses they've had. They always count on a mother, a wife, or a daughter to keep track of that for them. And so usually when you men go to the doctor's office, they take their portable, portable medical transcriptor with them. And so when I go to the doctor's office, my wife is sitting mm -hmm. there and the doctor will say to me, well, are you allergic to this? And I, are you allergic to anything? And I go, oh, no, no. And my wife will say, yes, you are. You're allergic to this. And I'm always grateful for that. But uh, they'll say, what medicines are you taking? And I'll say, oh, I'm not taking anything. 
and then there are apps for that. There are. And that's you what can I was write just say. all of your medicines down yes. in an app. If you and, don't have a wife and, and hand it daughter. to the doctor and say, or the nurse that comes in before the doctor and say, yeah. here are my medicines, so you don't forget one. If you have a smartphone, you can get a free app that will allow you to put in all of your medicines, the name, the di the prescription level, the pharmacy, the phone number of the pharmacy, all this stuff is just right there. So that if your doctor says, what have you been taking? And especially if you're into supplements, which we're going to be mm -hmm. talking about too, if you're taking any kind of medical supplement, uh, the doctor may or may not be familiar with the supplement or why you would be taking it. But they need that information too. And you may not think, oh, it's not relevant. I'm going in to see about knee pain uh, or I'm going in to see about fatigue and tiredness. And why would they need to know if I'm taking vitamin D or, or taking a thyroid supplement? Because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there's interactions. It, there and are. sometimes the, the doctor wants to give you a medication, but they shouldn't with the medications you're on or the supplements you're on. So they've got to either change the medication they want to give you or change the supplement and say, don't take the supplement. Why you're taking this medication it's very important so for people and, like you and if your friends have internet medical degrees <laughs> yeah and they've yeah. read all about this and they know what you need to do and you've been trying to do what your next-door neighbor told you that's you need to tell your doctor that advice. too advice yes it is you should never <laughs> listen to a non-medical person about or take their meds god forbid yeah. i mean you could have a huge medical you could have a huge reaction you could be allergic to something that's in that med that it's not in the name but yeah. it's in the medication yeah, if your it's aunt really says, dangerous oh, i had that last year and i have a few of those pills left why don't you try one or i had that 10 the, years ago let's yeah. see there's some lasix up there 10 years ago and you're a little puffy well you could throw yourself into being dehydrated and have a very low potassium and then you get a chest you get chest pain i mean you can do some real damage you have no idea but it really does take a medical degree to manage medicines well it does and i mean and people do funny things it, uh, anthropologists will tell you about a phenomenon known as magical thinking. Uh, if you have this magical uh, talisman, it'll protect you from evil spirits. Mm -hmm. And so what often happens is people get a medical prescription. Here's an antibiotic. You take this for 10 days or 12 <laughs> days and, and take all 12 of them. You'll take it for four days or five days and feel better. So then you'll stop taking it and put that medicine in your medicine cabinet and save it for when you really need it. And, and unconsciously you're thinking just the fact that you have that, you don't have to call the doctor, you don't have to go anywhere, you can run right into the medicine cabinet and get it, will protect you from getting an infection when in fact, Down the road. by taking only part of it, right? you, you have may it. have given yourself a super infection because you've only treated the bacteria or the virus for a short, too short a period of time and right. it goes crazy because it's only half killed. It adapts and it then modifies. gives you a super, a super infection. Yeah. Not a good idea as well. But, right. but if, but one of the things I think, especially for you, you right. should have on your computer. Yeah. Everything that's ever happened to you, because you, because <laughs> Brett's, Brett, God, can I tell on you? Brett's deer sure. in the headlights. We talk about this all the time. He comes into my office, deer in the headlights because he's sitting at my, my table and we're talking about him, he doesn't remember anything that's ever happened to him. And that's common. I mean, I, I have what's called white coat hypertension. And I don't even you wear a white coat. You go the doctor's office <laughs> and, and your tension goes up. It's like, oh my God, is, is this going to be bad? Am I going to get bad news? Is something awful going to come out of this? And Am that's I going to have common. surgery? So if you keep your yeah. history, and, and maybe this is when you go to a new doctor, but if you keep your history with everything that's happened to you, the newest drugs, you re-update it before you go in, it's not a lot of trouble because you're just going to update stuff that's happened in the last year. <laughs> I always had the philosophy, if you start going to doctors, they'll find something wrong because that's what they do for a living and that's how they make their money. <laughs> and, and I think I'm on the wrong side of that telescope. You know? yeah. and, and I'm learning. You're yeah. teaching me. But, so. <laughs> so, so here with the conversation for others who might be like me, uh, things that you ought to do to prepare yourself to go to a doctor's visit. So one of those things is actually think about it. Why am I going to the doctor? What do I want to discuss with them? They'll probably ask me some questions. One of those questions will be, uh, what are your symptoms? One of those questions will be, what medicines are you on? Now, they'll have the medicines they've prescribed for you. But if you see five other doctors and each of them prescribes something for you, probably the only person that knows all of that is your pharmacist. Mm -hmm. Because they and fill not out if you all go those, to different if, if you go to a consistent pharmacy or if you go to a national chain pharmacy that keeps your record in their computer. Mm -hmm. So... You might, if you don't know how to get this information, want to go to your regular pharmacist and say, give me a printout of everything I've taken in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And they can do that. 
and, and right. it will do that. But you should ask yourself that information. Do I have it? So if it comes up with the doctor, I can tell them. Because if they don't know that your other doctor is treating you for stomach distress and giving you a medicine for that, that may impact what they can prescribe for you or how they understand the symptoms mm -hmm. that you're talking about. That's right. So so think about it. What are your symptoms? What do you want the doctor to hear? You got five minutes. What do you really want to focus on? If you've been having problems with an ingrown toenail and but that's not really what you want to talk about, then don't talk about it. Talk about the problems with indigestion or sleeplessness or fatigue mm -hmm. or, or stomach, whatever, chest pains. Whatever is the most important thing, and then maybe two or three other symptoms that might be related. Yeah. But but the, here's how physicians, physicians have in their head and kind of a decision tree. One symptom comes up, God forbid it's fatigue because fatigue has lots of questions and lots of answers right. and lots of tests right. because it's common to many illnesses. Fatigue or being tired is one of the things that we go, oh, because it's a huge workup. But in our brain, we ask about sleep. Then the next thing we ask about how many hours we work a day and do we have two jobs and do we sleep at night and do we have too many things to do and you know is it is it a lifestyle problem do we eat appropriately do we eat too much sugar you know so we go through the lifestyle stuff then we start looking at things that could be illnesses if all of that's negative right and so many times we'll say now we need to change these things in your lifestyle so you have to do some work right. then i want to see you in 3 months do some blood tests have you come back and then see if if you're better, right. and if you're not better, then we're going to go on to the next step. Check your thyroid, check your adrenal gland, check your, you know, many other things that would cause fatigue. Look at your blood count, see if you have le leukemia, lymphoma, but basically there are some other triggers for looking at that, and a doctor mm -hmm. might look at that immediately. Right. So these are these are things that we have in our head that when you when you say you've we got as this, physicians. we as physicians yeah. that as that you can't really do with a computer because there's just too many synapses. Mm -hmm. So we look at this and we say, this problem, ask question, 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 question. Oh, we're going this way, mm -hmm. basically. Or we've got two options, so we're gonna do a test. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how our brain works. But we need to know what's wrong with you, what makes it better, what makes it worse, how long has it been going on? Um Basically, that's it. How severe is it? Mm -hmm. And so those are the issues. So you keep that in your mind. Write those things down first. Then you write down medications. You write down new hospitalizations. Anything new that's happened to you since you've been to that doctor? Even if you don't think it's relevant. You're going to a doctor about chronic headaches and you had hemorrhoid surgery. Tell them. That's right. Because anesthesia may change something. Right. So you have to, you have to think about that. But that's uh, basically what you want to have written. Because the doctor goes... Right down. They take that piece of paper and they look at it and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In their mind, they've just done 10 minutes work by just looking down your list. Okay. So when they're ready to talk to you about it, be able to answer the questions. How does it feel? Where does it hurt? How often does it hurt? Does it fluctuate when it mm -hmm. hurts? Uh, is it a specific pain? You know, they'll say, is it a shooting pain or is it a radiating pain? There are things that descriptively you can learn the terminology of and you can describe what's going on inside your body so that the doctor can make sense out of it. Mm -hmm. And not just sort of a global, I feel bad. I feel tired. Right. It, it's You have to actually in, introspect and think about mm -hmm. what that tired really mm -hmm. feels like. Is it, I ask people to discern that, do you feel like you're going to, you know, crawl into the next room? Right. If it's that kind of tired, that's different than I'm tired during the afternoon or I'm tired two hours after a meal. If you stand up and suddenly, just, you get dizzy. Yeah. That kind of thing. So, yeah. so then those kind of fatigues or tired are indicate different things to us. Okay. So, so, so things to do: prepare your medical history, your recent medical history, to be able to share with the doctor. If you've been to other physicians or hospitals or had interventions, mm -hmm. get a list of all the medications and supplements that you take and have it ready to hand, uh, so that you can give them a copy or or make it available to their office if they want it or if mm -hmm. they need it. Uh, ask yourself, interview yourself the questions. What are my symptoms? What do I want to talk about? What's the top thing on my list? Not just go in globally and expect to have a half hour conversation where it all gets pulled out of you like pulling teeth. They don't have the time uh, to, to do that. They might or might not want to it's do that. It's not productive time. It's, it's really productive time for you and for the doctor if you've already thought about it. But then some of the things that I, you should also write on your list at the very bottom is what do you want to know? 
What does that doctor want need to tell you? Do you want to know? Like I always say, what do you think it is? Mm -hmm. Do you want to know if you have cancer? Do you want to know what to do next? Do you right. want to know if you should take medicines? You should ask that question or those questions at the very bottom of the page. That's basically how the thinking goes of a physician. And so he or she should answer your questions before you leave and give you a treatment plan. I always told my patients, I'm not going to let you leave the room until I've got a plan for you. Yeah. And you shouldn't leave a room until the doctor has a plan for you. If they just turn around and walk out, that's not helpful for you. You don't know what's going on. You don't know if you're dying or if there's nothing wrong with you. Well, and some and you should say, "Hey, doc." <laughs> some doctors' back. offices have this automated, and what they'll say to you is, "My nurse will be in in a few minutes to do whatever, to clean, clean up the visit, and finish it, and she will give you a handout for home care, mm -hmm. so that when you go home, this is how you change mm -hmm. your bandages, or this is how often you take your medicine, mm -hmm. or this is what you do in response mm -hmm. to this complaint, because they see consistent complaints uh, at a given time or in the geographical area about certain things, and mm -hmm. so they have handouts ready. Right, we have handouts for a lot of things that. Once our EMR or our electronic medical records up and running, that we'll be able to just print out. Depending on what's wrong with you or what your issue is, right. you'll have information that's that actually explains each problem. And so then the next element of this conversation is you need to be medically compliant. If they <laughs> give you a list of things to do or a prescription to take, you need to do those things and take those prescriptions. Because if you don't, you've wasted their time and your time and your money and, and your, your health continues to deteriorate. Money and deteriorate. Yeah, yeah, you know, my, my dad used to go, to go to the doctor all the time. And He'd come home and I'd say, well, what did the doctor say? He said, well, I should do this, but I'm not going to. Yeah. I said, I look, I look at him and I go, so did you tell the doctor you're not going to? No, none of his business. Then don't go to the doctor. And he would always think that if he was getting a test, that was like treatment. If you're getting an MRI or an EKG or something, that's not making you better. It is just a diagnostic tool so your doctor can tell you what's wrong. Yeah. He would always feel better if they had a test. Well, that's ridiculous. And the, if and the you other, don't do the other it, buzzword is, uh, besides treatment, is procedure. Oh, I went to the doctor's office and I had a procedure. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so what? What? Did, what happened? You know. So I don't know, the nurse came in and did some things under her sheet, and I came home. <laughs> you know, it's like okay. I mean, I know. Is people, that what I thought I, you were saying? That was you when you came. No, home no, no, that's not me. I, <laughs> but I, I no. know people that yeah. that don't pay that much attention. They, it's it's, work it's to be magical a thinking, you know. I went to the doctor, so that's I've touched home base. Now I'm going to be safe for a while. Well, it's work to be a patient, and I mean sometimes. Okay, let's let's do the outside chance that somebody were to have a diagnosis of terminal lung cancer. Okay, so you but you can have a choice of whether you want to take chemo or not. And if you choose not to do that, that's your own that's your own business. But in general, yeah, yeah, in general. you should comply with what the doctor wanted you to do because if you don't and you come back, like if people don't do their labs and they come back to see me, I'm like well, now we're just going on history. Yeah. So you better know a lot about your history, about what happened in the meantime in the last four months. Mm -hmm. Because I have no data. So I'd like to know exactly what happened in the last four months to your symptoms. And I usually do this. I take the symptoms somebody came in with and that they checked off themselves or they gave me in the beginning. And then I had them, I asked them each symptom, is that 100% better? Is that 50% better? Is that 0% better? And that helps me decide what to do next, how successful my treatment was. It doesn't hurt my feelings. Right. It just makes, gives me the ability to quantitate. My father was diabetic. And he would never give up ice cream or donuts. And the doctor kept talking to him about you've got to watch your calorie intake, you got to watch your sugar intake, you got to eat these kind of things. He was on insulin shots a couple, three times a day, but he would never stop eating donuts or ice cream. And he died of a heart condition. You know, Secondary so, to diabetes, probably. So, so his argument all the way to the point of death was, it's not the diabetes, it's my heart problem. It's the diabetes you know, that caused the heart problem. I, I, I believe you that. You know that. I absolutely believe that. But And he knew that, but he didn't change his behavior. He was non-compliant. Yeah, we're and all in if denial about the doctor about asked him, things. have you quit eating donuts and ice cream? He would say, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm not eating that stuff anymore. But he was lying. 
You know? I know. And, and, and so that's not smart could, when you do that. We can lie to ourselves. Yeah. But, 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 your but it's not healthy to lie to your doctor because if you don't tell them everything, they well, can't possibly come up with the right answer. It's like having a mystery with only one of the 10 clues given to you. And and then it makes medicine very expensive. If you don't tell them everything, the, the doctor everything, then he's got to do, she's got to do tests all the time to try to figure out what you're not saying. So well, it's, it's like the old joke about the six blind men, you know, describe. <laughs> the elephant and they it, it just it doesn't all come together in a cohesive or coherent picture unless you give them the information to work with that, that you have about what's going on with you and if somebody if a doctor tells you not to eat certain things right. sometimes we have to actually tell you if you feel like you're not going to comply you tell them I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Then the doctor can tell you what will happen to you if you don't comply which usually then makes people comply but if they just without threatening you because they're trying to be kind they say don't eat ice cream don't eat candy yeah. cake cookies any of that junk don't drink alcohol right then they're saying that for a reason it's not because they're trying to deprive you but then if you say you're not going to do that well there's also a way to discuss i have that. people that say that you know you, you can say okay i understand it's a real challenge for you because you're addicted to ice cream so let's do addictive treatments and wean you off mm -hmm. of it let's scale you down let's go from a half gallon every two days to a pint mm -hmm. every two days and with the idea being that in three months you won't be eating ice cream because you'll change your habit and you won't be car craving it yeah just you know, like anything else. Your routine. I, I remember years ago, I used to drive a certain route home, and I had like a 20-mile drive home, and I would always swing by Dairy Queen and get a milkshake you know, for my drive home. I had to stop driving home that way. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> in idea. In order to get myself That's to, a really good idea. Behavioral not, modification. Yeah, because I was so habituated. I mean, the car would just turn in. <laughs> I'd be driving home on autopilot, and I'd be sitting at Dairy Queen. It's like walking up to the snack cabinet every time you walk exactly. in the refrigerator, or when you're or stressed, walk into the kitchen at home. Yeah, and you go and you look. Mm -hmm. and you so, so there are a couple of other things that we wanted to mention that you shouldn't do in terms of your own health care when you're involved with professional health care management. One of them is stay off the internet. <laughs> Don't research all of your symptoms and your illnesses. It'll scare you to death. And half of that stuff is uh, sort of idiosyncratic blogging that people do. Mm -hmm. and, and is not medical research or medically It may not even apply to you. It, it, I mean, how can you're not medically trained, so it may not apply to you. And it does take a medical training. And medical training, I had somebody ask me, say, well, I could have been a doctor. Well, he didn't go to college. And I'm like, uh, that would be tough because you have to be top of your class in high school, top of your class in college, and then maybe, just maybe, you'll get into med school. So it does take a brain. Well, and, and then TV doctors. You, know, you, you can watch Dr. Oz. That's entertainment. That's not medicine. Don't treat yourself based on a three-minute segment you saw on Dr. Oz. Mm -hmm. uh, there used to be a thing years ago in, in the 50s and 60s, one of the most popular network shows <laughs> in America was Marcus Welby, MD. <laughs> and doctors in hospitals were warned, Marcus Welby would air on Monday, mm -hmm. uh, and they were warned that on Tuesday they get an influx of calls mm -hmm. for whatever issue was discovered, discussed on Marcus Welby the night before. Mm -hmm. So they called it the Marcus Welby syndrome. Every Tuesday, <laughs> they get, so, so doctors I were advised, doctor be aware of what <laughs> Marcus is doing mm -hmm. because you're going to get these calls. You need to be able to say, That's you watched Marcus Welby last night, didn't you? You know. That's interesting. Now, yeah. probably one or two of those people had something like that. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and then the third thing is don't over-treat yourself for your symptoms by going to the grocery store or Target or the pharmacy and buying supplements based on the little descriptive things on the supplement or in the news magazine page that says, oh, we can, we can cure, you know, all these things if you just take the supplement. You know, get some real information from a real person who has training and knowledge and then decide in conversations with them, is this something that I ought to try? And if I try it, what should I see in the way of symptom alleviation or in the way of feeling better in, in what amount of time? If they have the time to discuss that with you and respond, it would be helpful to you. They're more likely to have that time if you do your prep work. You need to do homework before you go to the doctor, just like being in school. So do your homework. And don't bring in your entire diary for the last month or six months of every single thing. Or email it. Yeah. Gosh, because that's so confusing to us. We can't sort out what's wrong with you. We need to have a bigger picture. We don't need a daily picture. So remember that. 
Write well, out your what, information you, for your doctor. I, I talk to your nurses, and they get emails because they, there's a personal relationship between They're them nice. and your patients. They get emails. So the patients will write in and say, I was having some symptom when I took my daughter to her girlfriend's birthday party. <laughs> no, it wasn't really the birthday party. We had gone oh, yeah. to the pizza place, and and there, you know, and, and we had this kind of pizza, and they put all this extraneous information in there that's not relevant to the symptom of the issue it's because they're everything. chatting with a friend yeah. you're not chatting with a friend this you know go get a friend <laughs> <laughs> this is a nurse who's taking care of you medically who's interested in you personally but she's not interested in where you had pizza unless it's relevant to your symptom that's right so so hone that down and make sure you bring everything written to your doctor and see if you can get it on one page yeah. every time so that you can have a very a powerful and effective visit. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.